Drum roll. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited because this month of February, all month long, we are only celebrating amazing women in science from around the world. By month's end, we will have done 40 hangouts with incredible women from across the globe. It's been a very exciting time, and so thank you guys for joining us today. Right now, we've got three classes joining us from across North America. Some of them are having some technical difficulties, so I'll just introduce them. Uh, so we've got Miss Spears, grade four through sevens in Moberly Lake, BC. Hi, guys. We've got Miss Gerard's class working. Let's see if they got it working. Nine tens in San Carlos, California. Hey, we think they're there. They're there. We'll figure it out. <laughs> and then we've got Miss Barajas, grade sixes in Oxnard, California. Hi, guys. Hi. Awesome. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Hawaii by Dr. Sonia J. Rowley. She is a research scientist, uh, a marine evolutionary biologist at the University of Hawaii's Manoa School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Growing up in an ocean-loving family, she has spent over 35 years diving across the globe, uh, pushing the boundaries of exploration to find new species and gain a new understanding of deep sea life in the oceans, uh, for which, in 2016, she received the prestigious Sir David Attenborough Award. So that first Further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rowley. Thank you so, so much for joining us and take it away. All right. Well, hello, everybody. How are we doing? Let me just see if I can share my screen. Is this working? It's working. I'll let you know when you're on your slide. All right. So, how's that? Does that work? Hey. All right. Just, yes. Yeah. There we go. Is this it? Is That's this it. it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Fabulous. So we're exploring by the seat of our pants today, which is uh, the way I tend to roll as a general rule, but not through irresponsibility. So as you know, my name's Sonia, and um, I sound funny because I'm from England originally, um, but I'm not a fan of the cold, and now I live in Hawaii, which is fantastic. So I'm going to talk to you today um, about some of my research and some of my exploration. Now, there's going to be some images coming up. There's me uh, bringing out my species of science. Um, there was me a few days ago. Here's just some of the things that I've been able to do as um, part of my life and my research today. So I get down to go in submarines. There's my lab. Um, there's the wonderful submarine, actually. It was really cool. There was in Ball's Pyramid. I was the, young, the uh, deepest dive ever to go there. This is um, uh, me with corals on my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> They're fungid, so I called it a fungal infection. These are chimney vents. This was the boat I was raised on as a child. That was me when I was four. And then there's my father taking me in for my first dive when I was 11. The legal age at that point for diving was uh, 14. So that's a real quick run through of some of the things um, I've been up to. So what's happening now? So we're going to be talking about exploration. Now, to me, exploration is a matter of scale. And it can be on the global scale all the way down to the micro scale and to the genes and the expression of genes, which enable us to adapt and survive to the environment in which we are in. Now, so here we are. We have evolution. And we have microevolution, which is changes and adaptations within a lifetime and within behavior and some traits, the way we look. And there's macroevolution, which is when those changes get to such a degree that an animal can turn into a new species. And this is some of the work that I, well, this is a large body of the work that I actually research. But I happen to use the diving skills that I was raised with in order to do that. And I use the group Gorgonian corals. They have traits that, oh, hello. What's just happened there? Um, 
Oh, <laughs> there we go. Java decided it wanted to update right now. Anyway, so I use Gorgonian CFAN corals, and I'm going to tell you a bit about those very shortly, and then explain to you about mesophotic reefs, which are the deep reefs that I mainly dive on, and some of the research that's actually come as part of that, and some of the conservation issues that have arised, and how the deep research has helped very much with shallow coral reefs as well. So. Now, corals. What I want to highlight to you is octocorals, which are the Gorgonians. They actually constitute 64% of all corals you'll find on this planet. So, Scaractinians, which are the hard corals, you've actually got the, only 27% of those constitute all the corals, and only 14% of those are the reef building corals that we see um, that are familiar with in the shallow reefs. So the most species and abundance of corals on this planet actually occur below 50 meters and are octocorals. Octocorals, what's an octocoral? So basically that means that the actual coral polyp can, is actually divided into eight, where the corals that you'll see on the shallow reefs, the hard corals that you're very familiar with are divided into six or multiples of six. Gorgonian octocorals also have what we call a pinnate tentacles, which you'll see that red arrow. And that expands the surface area for that coral, for these coral group, to absorb more nutrients. So it makes them one of the major reasons why they're so biologically successful. Also, I find them very beautiful. There are many ways to be a Gorgonian coral. You've got twists and turns and all sorts of things. Also, they can look like this, and I can be quite vain, and I think this one's quite ugly, but this is also a Gorgonian coral. There we go, I'm human. Now, there's these things called sclerites, and they are the skeletal material these little skeletal elements, little bits of bone that you can only see under a microscope, that actually make up with the soft tissue of the Gorgonian. This next slide will put this into context. So these red arrows are showing you sclerites, okay? And those are what make up these polyps, which then make up the colony. Here you can see the optometry, the division in eight. Now here I want to highlight to you this polyp. This is from a very deep, deep sea Gorgonian. And it's a new species and it sits here very high. It's a couple of meters high. And um, taxonomists, people who name species have quite a bit of fun. So have named this particular species this. So being a scientist can be a lot of fun. And also Gorgonians have these, which are pygmy seahorses. You may have come across these um, in your studies and they are extremely cute and I find a lot of them. In fact, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but I found a new species a couple of years ago on this coral, 80 meters down in Micronesia. So there it is, super, super tiny. So. Gorgonian corals have many, many things attached to them, from the microbes all the way to these CITES listed, highly protected pygmy seahorses. And so here I do the microbiology field sampling. So I just sucking up the mucus in order to see how that relates to the animal's success. So it's all about biological success. Why are they doing so well? Now, I'm going to introduce to you the deeper reefs. So here you have a reef, and most of the research is done here by this scuba diver there, um, because we can go down there and we can access all those depths because of scuba. Now, most of the research thereafter has been done in the deep ocean beyond 150 meters or 500 feet. But the research I do, I also do the shallow stuff and the deep stuff in submarines, but I use rebreather diving technology to dive here, 
And so there I am. <laughs> it's a bit of a joke. I was trying to find a cartoon of Marie Bree that I couldn't find it. Um, and so this is the mesophotic coral ecosystems, which are also cold, I can tell you, when you're in a wetsuit. They, the temperature drops significantly. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those. Now, these mesophotic reefs, these deeper reefs, are characterized by differences in light because the light level gets lower and lower the deeper you get the water flow changes the temperature is variable and also the salinity and water chemistry is very different from the shallow and the much deeper reefs it's actually extremely variable so here are some of the places that i've researched my research is mainly in the indo-pacific but there's still so much that we don't know but what I can tell you is that most of these reefs are dominated by these Gorgonian corals, which you can see here. So these pictures are taken from Ponape in Micronesia. And there, on you can see on the right hand side, there's basically walls of Gorgonians. Now, here are just some of the new species that I have found. In my lab at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, I have 7,000 specimens of these animals, and most of those are new species to science that I have collected and running experiments on and analysing why they are so successful. This group is so successful. It's been in the, our oceans, the world's oceans, for 750 million years. Now, they hold some keys to survival. Now, rebreathers. This is what I use to go down to depth. Now, normal scuba, when you breathe out, you get bubbles. With a rebreather, it recycles that gas. Because when you breathe out, you've got 16 to 17% oxygen that you're wasting. So I recycle it, and my rebreather helps me to fortify what I then breathe with all the right gases that I need for the depth that I'm at. And that usually generates some questions, so we can come back on that in the Q&A. But this is the rebreather I use, and it's awesome, basically. Now, here's my dive profile for an average 150 meter dive, which is just under 500 feet. And what you'll notice when I'm at depth at the bottom there at 150 meters, I don't get much time there, usually between 20 and 30 minutes. And you'll notice that that red line is gradually getting shallower and shallower. And I spend a lot of time in the shallows. But what I do is I keep working all the way up. So I drop down and then work, 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 work. And this can be for about eight hours. So I get a full day's work on that dive, which is good because lots of science can be done and lots of data collection can happen. So here's some of the environmental variables. I hustle all the time with big companies to let me use their equipment. I've got light, temperature, water flow, salinity, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll A, nutrients, all these things. I'm there just trying to measure them all, to try and characterize these environments to find out why these animals are able to sort of deal with it. Um, here's just an example of some of the things that I do. I'm doing behavioral observations. This is macro, I'm filming macro um, feeding by the Gorgonian. This is at 96 meters of depth. And, and so here's just a little video of these corals. And what I've noticed is they don't eat zooplankton, which what everyone thinks that they do. They have these stinging cells that are very weak. They couldn't catch a cold. So I'm working at the moment to find out exactly what they're eating. And what I'm finding at the moment is they have a lot of weird behavior as well. And this can be for another session because that's a big subject in itself, but it's very funny. These coral polyps do all sorts of weird things, but they certainly don't catch food. Now, um, here's where going by the seat of your pants. Now, 
I was on a re- I was leading a research expedition and the weather came in bad. So I decided I wanted to learn why this particular coral here, Anella, which means angel in Hawaiian, is so successful because you can find it in the shallow waters at 30 degrees centigrade all the way to, at depth actually below 16 degrees centigrade. And I'm like, how can it deal with that temperature variance? Because I certainly can't. So I decided to run an experiment. So I got a whole bunch of clippings from each colony and I put them at 30 meters, 90 meters and 130 meters to see how they would cope with it and left them there for a year. And here we are, There's, um, I'm checking out the dive site. This is gonna go over time a little bit, but I wanted to show you a little bit about science, uh, the experiment side of science. So I'm making sure that here's the deep environment, 90 to 100 meters. I've got lots of corals that I can sample from. Here I am doing some sampling um, in order to run the experiments. Then I'm tagging the corals and photographing that coral so I can go back to it every year to do growth. Here we are in the shallows making the experiment. And then the following day, I then go down and I place the experiment at the depth that I want it to be at. And so this is how we run or I design experiments and to test how these animals are so successful. And here they are at different depths and I'm running them perpendicular to the flow. Okay. So. This is what happened. Over the course of the year, there was a huge bleaching event around the globe. And this filamentous cyanobacteria overgrew all the reefs around Micronesia. And that's what happened with my experiments in the shallow. So if I bring this forward a little bit, you can see that it was just carpeting it everywhere. And it was really, really, I mean, just the whole reefs were dead. But at depth, everything was alive. Everything was alive and well. So I knew my experiments worked. So why would we have this bleaching event. Now, one of the things I did as part of that experiment is I measured temperature every 10 meters all the way down to 150 meters with these little temperature loggers. And so here's what happened over the course of my experiment. First of all, you'll notice there's a lot of variation in temperature. And then it shoots up in the spring of that year and the whole reef began to die. And one of the main reasons why it began to die is because of the temperature difference, but also because of the overfishing in the Indo-Pacific, which has taken many of the fishes that eat the algae. So the algae can overgrow the reef and this will penetrate to up to 60 meters. Now, just actually going back there, through doing research spontaneously, I learned that all that variation, that you can get 20 degrees variation in temperature a day, that's intense. And yet those Gorgonian corals survive very happily, where hard corals can't. I also learned that you get internal waves and you get surf at 90 meters depth would you believe it and so by exploring where no one else has been before i have learned tremendous amount of things about the natural environment of our deep reefs and that these can hold keys to biological survival for the shallows i also learned 
that here the circles here the microbiome the the, uh, the microbes the bacteria they're associated with those corals no matter what i do with them and where i take them they always have the same symbionts the same bacteria so that shows me that there's a strong relationship between the coral host and its microbiome and only when health really went bad did the microbiome collapse so this is research i'm looking into also i do a lot of reef monitoring and here's may doricott who will be speaking with you in march um, who came out on one of my expeditions to monitor the shallow reefs what we found also that year is that high wave exposure reefs did really well but low wave exposure reefs really died on the atolls the most beautiful reefs i've ever seen the next year were coated in crustose coralline algae and were dead similarly another atoll beautiful reefs still last year were dead because we've outfished them coral reefs can handle one or two stresses but it's used to handling temperature variances over the millennia, but it cannot handle overfishing and pollution and temperature. So we have to be really, really conscious and proactive to how we deal with our reefs. And here are the fisheries. $36 million a year are spent on licenses given to foreign fisheries to fish out the oceans of the Indo-Pacific and Micronesia and Indonesia and so this is a major problem so these are the things that I discovered just from finding new species to science there's so much more and that our reefs are so connected so I share I believe we can't give away what we can't keep what we've got without giving it away so I go out with the people and I share with them and I encourage my students to share and we pass on the message to bring about awareness so people are much more aware and delighted by science, but also conscious about how we live our lives and what we do about recycling and things like that. So here's a small video that I wanted to share with you, and then we'll take some questions. So this is a Pakeen Atoll. There should be music, but I don't know if it's going to come through. Here we go. And this is the atoll. There's no electricity. They'd not seen a drone before. And they'd not seen their reefs like this before. I get to see manta rays. And lots replacing cylinders of different gas mixes that will enable me to come up if a problem happens, which has never happened. Here are my favorite things, the Gorgonia. And now we are actually descending down and atoll, which is a remote atoll in the middle of the Pacific. Now at 135 meters, watch the shark. I was going to go in there, but I decided against it. Now I'm going down to 150 meters depth, 100 feet. And these are new species to science. No one has ever seen these before. Here's a new fish species, very colorful, because it's cheap to be colorful at depth because predators can't. These are Circumborea and very prized in the aquarium trade. And you find them only rare. There's fields and fields of Gorgonians here, where you find nursery grounds for fish food, fish species that people have for food. This is where they grow up. This is someone I used to work with that does connect for the aquarium trade. And I actually don't agree with it anymore. Uh, but 
this is how it works. They get a lot of money. And transex, and I analyze the species, and you can see the fish swimming around amongst all that dominate these areas. And they're under the oceans, under the waves, and no one else gets to see. These have been here for hundreds of thousands of years and have been evolving and changing over time. And then me. And there's us sounding on helium. Now I'm going to show you very briefly a couple of minutes. I was in that submarine off Hawaii on Luihi, which is the youngest island in the island chain of Hawaii. And it is a live active volcano. And we decided to dive on it. So here are the chimney vents, these little finger chimney vents. They're extremely hot. You can see the shimmering water. And that, these chimney vents, that's bacteria changing the iron that is coming out from the earth mantle. So I get to learn a lot of geology and how islands are formed. Here is a chimera. It's one of the oldest fish species. Very old, very slow, very ancient, very great. Here is a coral, a, it's probably about 400 years old. They take so long to grow and the excess fishing, and that's hundreds of years of growth, but here they're like sponges. This sponge is about three meters. And it has lots of other animals living on it. Wow. Very, very enchanting. Next is a new species of sea coral that I discovered. And all those things that are on it are just brittle stars, giant brittle stars that feed off the plankton in the water. So they're not harming coral. But we nickname this purple haze because it's purple. But now, very quickly towards the end of this film, we roll for questions, is we decided to do bait stations. Putting down scraps of food to see what fishes and crustaceans would come. So we're down in Pellis, over 1,300 meters deep. And here is a giant Pacific sleeper shark. Bashing up against the submarine. He was huge. Fortunately, it worked out. <laughs> and we were able to go on and see Dumbo, the deep sea octopus here. It's quite hard to get good footage. So here we go down and we quantify, and we don't know what we're going to expect. So, that's just a little snippet of some of the research that I do today. So I think we'll go back now. And um, I think I go out of the screen sharing yeah. and hear uh, what you guys have to say. Outstanding, Sonia. That was impossibly beautiful. Thank you so, so much. What a great presentation. Um, all right, so I know some classes might be having some tech difficulties. Before we dive into questions, I just want to note there's some groups watching on YouTube as well. If you want to write in your questions there, I'll pass them along to Dr. Rowley, so please do.
But let's start. So, Miss Spear, you've been writing in a lot of questions, but your video's on. So, if you guys want to just say a question, you're welcome to. And if not, I can always take one of the ones you've written. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yeah, you're great. Okay. You ready? Do you want to ask your question about what you were seeing down there? Uh, so, what? You want to come and ask it, or should I ask for you? Um, uh, what is the white stuff under the super shirt? Oh, right. Well, that was bits of food, actually. So they were little chunks of tuna and um, and squid, and so that was the white stuff. But the thing is, we were there for a few hours, eight hours in total, and that Pacific sleeper shark, who's blind as a bat, didn't eat any of it. It just came to check us out. But by the white stuff is little bits of yellow stuff, and that is bacteria. Very cool. Thanks, Anya. Great question. Uh, all right, Ms. Barajas, class, if you guys have a second question, come on up. Um, what are internal waves? Oh, right. Well, that was a whole new world for me. Basically, so you know you've got waves in the shallow, and then in the deep, deep ocean, you've got this deep ocean current that can go up to two knots that goes all the way around the planet. And, um, and that's what keeps our climate the way it is, right? So any changes in that. Um, will affect the climate and vice versa. But internal waves are waves that happen at different depths. So the ocean is actually what we call stratified. There's layers of it, like a layer cake. And this is something that um, has been known about, but we're really learning a lot more about it right now. And just through the experiments that I was running, we managed to discover that these internal waves that exist at a certain depth, at those slightly deeper depths, actually exist. And they can form from offshore in the middle of the ocean and actually start pumping in towards oceanic islands and atolls. And they will come in and they will actually crash and break and surf at depth. So that's what those temperature loggers were showing. Their temperatures going up and down and up and down. There's tidal differences and then they crash and then you get a surf. And I was like, my goodness, but they can be generated offshore. But then you get what we call an island mass effect. So those waves will go round and up and have different effects on the actual island or atoll and that's dependent on what we call the geomorphology which is the shape and different um, geological features of those um, land masses basically so it's a bit bit complicated but the fact of the matter is that there's different water bodies layered throughout the ocean behaving differently and influencing the biological biological communities that actually exist at those different depths. Very cool. One of the things we get with a lot of ocean researchers is this idea that we've explored more of the moon and Mars than the oceans. And every time we talk to an ocean researcher, things like that attest to it. So thank you. That was great. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Gerard, you guys figured out your tech. So let's uh, take a question from you guys. Go right ahead. Excellent. Go ahead. Okay. Um, nice and loud. I was wondering how climate change is affecting the temperature change and how the corals are adapting to that. Excellent. Yes. Well, as you can see from uh, when I showed that temperature graph that goes up over the year. And so climate change is having a significant effect on the corals and the ocean. And, and, I'm referring as well, particularly to the oceanic islands and atolls because they're more vulnerable, very vulnerable. Um, because they are also, because as climate change is happening, which it is, you've got the melting of the ice in the polar regions, which is actually increasing the, um, the sea level 
it's making things go up. And so the low-lying atolls are losing land. Now, that has a big effect, but bringing back the other aspect of the temperature, which is you highlighted, the localised effect on the corals. So as you, as you saw from those images that I brought up, it, um, what happens is the corals then, the, the hard corals, those shallow corals, they have a narrow temperature tolerance. So they can only tolerate te uh, temperature uh, uh, within a couple of degrees centigrade. And so what happens, they started to bleach, right? So the symbiodinium, their associated algae, started to be expelled from the coral because they produce things that are irritating to the coral, so the coral has to get rid of them, reactive oxygen species. I don't know what you've been taught already. And so they have to get rid of them. And, uh, and what happened was, is the temperature was so high that the crustose coralline algae on the atolls overgrew those corals before those corals could do anything about it. So basically what I was seeing was kilometers and kilometers of what was formerly beautiful reef, just 100% pink. I mean, that crustose coralline algae grew so fast, it even grew over the green algae. I've never seen anything like it. And atoll after atoll after atoll had the same thing, just death. And the thing is that, so the, those shallow corals don't deal with it very well um, because they've adapted over a longer time frame to a much more static temperature. But when you go to depth with the sea fan corals and some of the deeper scaratinian corals, they're used to temperature variances of up to 20 degrees centigrade in one day. It usually averages around 13 to 16. And it just, they're going up all like that all day, all day. Um, and that is, those are those internal waves. So those corals are highly adapted to temperature going up and down and up and down and up and down. So they cope with it very, very well. And so they're not going to get overgrown by anything because they're on it. But this goes to show you when an animal or a plant or a creature, some living form, including ourselves, if we're exposed to something that's very variable day after day after day, we're able to handle it. But if it's just static and just small variances, when like bad things happen or when extreme things happen, it's very hard for those creatures to actually survive. So it's typically those that have a larger depth range that are often able to deal with these variances more and those that have been able to adapt longer and have symbiodinium that are stronger. So a lot of Gorgonians have symbiodinium D, for example, the clay D. And so they can deal with those temperature differences and certain corals, parietes, they can be very durable as well, and they can survive. But what you'll also notice is um, coral reefs with a lot of wave exposure also have a lot of temperature variance. So those reefs, those corals were more adapted to the temperature changes, but they also were allowed that constant wave action was flushing away excess algae as well. So there's a lot of, so when people say, when the scientists say that the coral ecosystems are very dynamic and very finely tuned, you know, you've got all these different things coming into play, all these different factors, that's very true. That's very true. If one thing is out, that balance is gone. You know, I know I've gone off on one a bit there, but if you think about it in your daily life, right? If you've got one thing, you've got one assignment, you're going to do one assignment, this is all you've got to do, and you're going to focus on that and get it done. When you've got five, six, or seven, it's too stressful. I kind of want to break down. I want to go and buy some chocolate. You know what I mean? It's like excessive. It's over the top. 
Now, if you put that in a reef for that, the reef can deal with one stressor. But if you put multiple stressors on that reef, time out, it can't deal with it. So uh, I hope that answered your question, answered a whole bunch of, and put a whole bunch of other things in there as well. <laughs> Well, as I said at the beginning, we get a lot of the elements of the presentation you don't otherwise get in the Q&A. Great question, great answer. And when you were showing the images of coral reefs covered with one color algae, we would never seen anything like that before. One of the classes wrote in gasps all around. So it's, it's quite, the, quite the impact. Um, all right, so we have time for one more round of questions, guys. So let's start with this speech class again. If you guys have another one, come on up. OK, does somebody want to come? Or should oh. I ask one of the ones you already asked? OK, Jaden. <laughs> Sprint! There you go, no, you're good. <laughs> I was wondering if you ever went to the deep, deepest part of the ocean. Oh, no, I haven't, but I would love to. I've been, my deepest has been to just under 2,000 meters in the submarines. Um, I believe the deepest is something like uh, 6,400 meters by Bob Ballard and actually a nice lady in our department and she was in that submarine as well. So, uh, but I haven't met yet. One day. One day. I, I should note for the classes too, just so that you guys get a sense of scale, uh, the amount of people who've been in a submersible or who have dove as deep as Dr. Rowley are like maybe in the hundreds, possibly in the hundreds ever, maybe in like a low thousand, but that's about it in all of human history. So it's, it's a very unique uh, and unbelievable experiences uh, that she's been able to have. So it's great that we can have her with us today. Great question. Uh, Ms. Barajas, you guys have a second question. Come on up. Um, how does a coral kill the bacteria? Oh. All right, so that's a multifaceted question. Uh, now, bacteria. Now, if we think about, now I used to be a nutritionist before I became a scientist. I didn't go to university to become a scientist until I was 30 years old. I'm now a lot older. And uh, but I go in the ocean every day, I'm sure it keeps me young. And uh, so, now, the reason why I'm going off in this tangent, stay with me here. As a nutritionist, I learned that you are what you eat. Now, if I eat good food, fruits and vegetables and things like that, then my stomach feels good. If I eat rubbish, then my stomach doesn't feel very good. We farm bacteria in our gut. So we are what we eat. And it's exactly the same with the coral. So if it's in the right environment, it will have the opportunity to farm the right bacteria. But if the environment starts to get unmanageable, then the wrong bacteria tend to grow. So the coral's natural mechanisms of controlling the bacterial populations, because there's multiple different species and strains of microbes, and they're all communicating with each other through something called quorum sensing, and they're all communicating with the coral and back. The coral can control the different um, bacteria with chemistry, with their chemicals. They communicate with each other through their chemicals. Okay, this is very in-depth. Um, and is not something that I know enough about to really, really get heavily into. But what I do know is that they do communicate with each other. And when, they, when that balance is shifted from the influence of the environment, then the wrong bacteria get to talk louder and overthrow the coral's ability to control the communities. And those communities then become harmful to the coral. Does that make sense? Well, that's bad. You guys think so? Is that good? Yeah? Awesome. All right. Um, before we dive into a last question for Mr. Gerard's class, I want to note too, you mentioned at the really beginning of your presentation that you were legally diving at 11, which is hilarious. Uh, I want to note for most of our students, now the legal diving age in most places is 10. So most of you guys are actually able to have a license. 
and I really urge you to do it. It's like the coolest thing you will ever do, ever. So get out there. Uh, all right, let's take a last question from Mr. Gerard's group. You guys have one? Go right ahead. Yeah. Okay, so if scientists can figure out what DNA in like the deep water corals allows them to survive extreme temperature changes, could they add that to corals in the shallow end that can't survive extreme temperature changes? Well, that's part of some of the research that I'm actually doing right now. Um, but actually um, fortifying the bacteria uh, from one coral to another is, is quite controversial. And what people are actually doing more of is um, breeding corals that are a lot stronger and studying which ones that they can actually uh, provide the environment for them to actually grow the stronger ones, both the coral and the bacteria. But that is something that they could do. It's certainly a very good idea. I'm personally, what I'm doing is characterizing the bacteria that are actually part of the success and the communication between the coral and the host and then seeing how that then translates on how the shallow water ones, but whether we can actually fortify the bacteria at depth with the shallows, that is something that is quite different and, um, and we don't really know as yet. Okay, great question, very technical question. By the way, I very want to... For Mr. Art's class, in general, grade 9, 10 classes are very silent, and I appreciate that you guys are so willing to ask so many questions. That's awesome. Way to go, girls. Um, all right. We could do this a long time, but we're running out of time. So before we wrap up, Dr. Rowley, I just want to ask, is there a place where students can learn more, ask more questions, get more interested in coral, anywhere you can guide them to? Oh, well, my own website is always under construction because <laughs> it's just time. You know, um, there's the HAL website, which is the Hawaiian Undersea Research Lab, and the HIMB, uh, which is the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology, doing lots and lots of cutting edge research, mainly in the shallow water. Um, what I would certainly recommend is keeping your eyes peeled on social media. Do um, what I also do is I do Google, I have Google Scholarship search if you're really, really keen on this and put mesophotic in and gorgonians in. And then every day I get updates on what research is coming out every single day. So I know exactly what's going on. And keep included into social media, hook in, follow us all. Um, I. Uh, apparently, uh, at the moment, I'm the only woman um, using doing this kind of research at these depths, and particularly on Gorgonians. <laughs> this won't be forever, um, that's, um, which is good. And um, I've got uh, students coming to work with me that are working through their ranks of their training. And May Doricott is uh, someone, as I've mentioned before, she's going to be with you in about a month's time. And um, and she's one of the girls that are coming forward. Will be able to continue on, you know, with the work that that I'm doing. Um, so it's it's a growing thing. Keep your finger on the pulse. Follow us all. Friend us all up, and we'll keep you posted. And shoot questions. Don't ever be afraid to ask questions because then it will get me thinking, and we can set up a dialogue. I believe in sharing from whatever you're at. We're all the same, there's no hierarchy in life, and this to me is the most powerful way to actually engage and, um, and bring about action, is we share, we identify, we belong, we feel that sense of belonging, and then we change and we learn, and we're kinder to the environment, and we're kinder to each other. And if nothing else, remember that. <laughs> That's my soapbox. <laughs> Outstanding, Dr. Lally. Uh, so what we do at the end of every hangout is I'm going to, so boys and girls, if you guys could get ready, I'm going to demute every class's microphone. So if you guys could just join me in saying a huge thank you to Dr. Okay. Rowley for joining us today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is. I moved it. Awesome. Uh, I love the enthusiasm, guys. Great yeah. questions. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Dr. Rowley, thanks for joining us, and we, we'd love to have you back anytime. That was amazing. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's been wonderful to meet you all.